This is a podcast from The Bugle. The prison planet wallows beneath unfriendly skies. Down in the muck, creatures once human scrabble for survival in the hostile swamps. Why they were sent there, few of them remember. Once you're on parlax, you're not getting off. A rudimentary feudal system has formed the strongest and most organised, achieving a sort of government, preventing the most depraved of depravities in the interests of keeping some semblance of control. Let people lose that vast scrap of humanity and you can't keep them on the leash. Their jailers orbit in the sky above, very little supervision is needed, yet below the movements of the prisoners begin to achieve a sort of rhythm. A sense that rises from the mass of starved humanity, some shared song of victory or achievement. The Imperator looks down at the screen. Corporal, what's going on down there? The Corporal salutes carefully. Sir, I'm sorry, sir. That is the gargle. And this is The Gargle, the sonic glossy magazine to the Bugle's audio newspaper of visual world. I'm your host, Alice Fraser, and your guest editors for this week's edition of the magazine are uh, John Luke Roberts. Hello. 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 And Hello. Eleanor Morton. Hello. Hi. Before we chain ourselves together and start breaking the rocks that are this week's top stories, let's have a look at the front cover. The front cover of the magazine this week is a tower of live human bodies reaching upwards, representing the deep and profound shared struggle to acquire Taylor Swift tickets. The satirical cartoon this week is the launch of the Barbie movie with Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling, with a group of scientists in lab coats drawing a graph that explains where participating in the Barbie movie's rave reception falls on the scale between irony, nostalgia, post-irony, kitsch camp, post-kitsch, sub-camp, post-post-irony, and post-post-modern, post-pre-post-pre-irony. So, good to know exactly where you fall. Where's Susan Sontag when you need her? (laughs) I'm all of them. I'm every single one. I'm so excited about the movie. I mean, there you go. That's the thing. Are you genuinely excited or are you ironically excited? All of or it. Both. Yeah. Both. It's so. I'm so. I'm going to wear pink to the to the show. It's going to be great. I'm so excited. I'm going to wear my bomb bag. <laughs> the, if there yeah. is not a sequence, I, I can't. I can't watch the Barbie movie because it won't be. It won't be true to life. If there's not a sequence where two of, two of them clash groins aggressively for at least fifteen <laughs> minutes, it's not. It's not real, is it? Yeah. Or or you know, I hope one of them at least will have like gnawed off feet. <laughs> swapped heads mm. yeah let's go with oh, the real realism yeah i was i was more of my little ponies boy so i have no mm. no uh point of contact here well i mean there's a there's a welcoming community for for you if you wanted to reach into the nostalgia of bronydom i yeah i i i yeah, i'm not sure that's no, don't me. do it. I'm not sure. With a carefully gloved hand. I think that's a trap. <laughs> I think that's a trick. I'm not going in. It's a Trojan My Little Pony. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What can you get inside of My Little Pony? You'd be surprised. That's, that's probably dim, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Top story now, and this is the news that legal contracts have been updated for the modern age with a farmer a farmer being held liable for using a thumbs-up emoji on receiving a contract as saying that he had accepted the contract. Uh, so, John Luke Roberts, you've accidentally agreed to a contract with a thumbs-up. Can you unpack this story for us? Yes. So, it's in Canada. A judge said, that counts. That's basically it, isn't it? There was a, a farmer and somebody had a long-standing business relationship with... Uh, there was the, the guy sent him... The buyer said, here's a contract for buying that grain, and the farmer replied with a thumbs-up. And the judge has ruled that to mean that that is legally binding. Whereas he was arguing that uh, the contract was just, um, he was just saying, yes, I've received that, which I think actually, I am kind of with the judge on this. I think a thumbs up on a contract for yes, I've received that does not mean yes, I've received that. It does, it is worrying though, as as, uh, precedents go, because this means that legally when I reply to a joke with a cry laughing emoji, it means I actually have laughed at the joke and I can assure you that I haven't. <laughs> You're contractually obliged to laugh until you cry, John Luke. Yeah, I guess that's it too, isn't it? But just two tears. Just two tears. <laughs> or, well, although they do have to be from separate eyes. Separate. So I, if I can only get like one eye crying, then it doesn't Then uh, you'll doesn't be like fit. the statue of the Virgin Mary. Mm-hmm. In many ways I am. <laughs> I mean you, you Stoical, do you look good in blue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of it, and I, I like it. I think we should dispense with contracts altogether and aim towards an entirely pictographic language again, 
back to sort of hieroglyphic things. So just picture of wheat, picture of wad of cash, thumbs up. That's all we need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just bring it back to leaving complex curses on your graves for people to find and then uh, deduce in year three for some reason. That, I feel like th year three is the prime age for a uh, hierog hieroglyphic translation. Hmm. Huh. <laughs> Was that just me? Well, it, <laughs> it, I, I'm sure it's really, that. it's probably really good observational material. But again, I have no way of uh, no contact with this. I, I can't. Uh, if you didn't specifically do a project on Tutankhamun when you were in year three, this joke's going to go over your head. <laughs> I don't know what age year three is, but I definitely did one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I completely misunderstood. I thought you meant. 3 AD. <laughs> I thought there'd been a search in Egyptology at that point. Right, this makes far more sense now. Oh no, this is like the cryptocurrency thing all over again. You thought it couldn't possibly be as dumb as I was saying it was. <laughs> and then this it was is three different school systems, um, and this is why this podcast is is so problematic because none of us really know <laughs> what ages we talk about with each other. It's really difficult. Which is why we need to go back to emojis. No room for misinterpretation yes. there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, have you ever signed a contract with a thumbs up, Eleanor? I mean, I, I've, I've done the equivalent, which is not really read it and then scribble my name very quickly. Um, and I have to say, uh, an emoji... Emoji response is great because sometimes uh, if you sign a contract, for some reason, some people still want you to print it out, sign it in real life, scan it and upload it again. And um, and that is that is it's exhausting to do all of those things and still not read it at the same time. You basically have to be trying really hard not to let your <laughs> eyes skim the page. The contract could be paying me a million pounds, but if I had to print it out, sign it and rescan it, I wouldn't do it. It'd be off. I don't I think, care what, I think, it's, what it's for. I think you need to reassess your priorities. Though. <laughs> I just got rid of my printer. I wasn't using it, and um, nobody sent me nobody sent me anything to print off anymore. No, um, I feel like I've sent Luke definitely plenty of text messages where an emoji has been the entire response, and um, it's it's. I'm glad that there was no legal precedent there because because God knows what I could have meant. I'm gonna have to scroll back through my WhatsApps. Yeah. There's a hi hierarchy now because you can, now you can do an, a reaction emoji on the body mm -hmm. of the previous yeah. message, which is less mm -hmm. commitment than a full emoji in a separate message, mm -hmm. which implies that you've engaged more fully and emotionally with mm. the message and have had taken the time rather than just attaching your emotion to their original thought. Yeah. Well, there's also like if you reply with the emoji as a separate message, it, it's it's bigger. Mm. So if I'm just doing a tiny cry laugh at one of Luke's jokes that that you know that's more realistic just just a little bit of a chuckle that made you feel melancholy towards the end <laughs> if it's a separate uh that's his brand if it's a separate emoji that's massive that that really yeah. oversells how much I enjoyed yeah all right well I, uh, it's interesting you're bringing yourself <laughs> and then of course the next level up is saying the emoji that you would do if yeah. you were able to n navigate the emoji menu, which is mainly uh, for boomers, but also for people who like to think of themselves as literary, yes. incapable of engaging with the confusing world of pictures. So just like typing, cry typing, laughing, sad or, face emoji, yeah, oh yeah or, or um, yeah, disassociation heart. emoji, yeah, yeah. eggplant, eggplant. And that's one of my favourites, the disassociation emoji. <laughs> what does that look like again? <laughs> it's, the, it's got a dotted rim on the outside of it. It's a, oh, it's is a that smiley that face is? with dot 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 dot. That's what I think of it for. Oh. I think before that, people used the melty face for yeah. disassociation, but now I think it's the dot, dot, dot. I prefer Monocle Man. I feel he's enigmatic. I like Monocle Man, although I, I do wonder... You're doing whether... Monocle Man face right now. I am doing Monocle Man face. Mm. And then there's the one with the finger on the face. The not, the not Monocle Man. Man who wishes he had a monocle because then he wouldn't the have thinker. to raise his hand to his face. It means I feel they're similar. But no one, no one actually ever does that. Do you guys do the face of the emoji you're trying to look for when you when you um in uh, order to seek it out yeah I don't, I don't think i do no i think i, don't I think do. <laughs> no but when i'm doing a uh, talk to text i imbue the te talking text with the emotion uh in my voice as i deliver it which apparently is weird apparently you're meant to deliver it in a robotic monotone oh, okay. mm -hmm. does that translate into emojis or does it you can't you can't um talk to text in emoji no by by its very nature text is stripped of external mm. signifiers on the monocle man I do think there should be more emojis with obsolete technology in. Like, I want a trebuchet man. I don't just want... Uh... Steam engine man. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 
The only thing that can beat a good a bad man with a trebuchet is a good man <laughs> with a trebuchet on slightly higher ground. Yeah, as long as they've got like really good mathematics sorted out for the aim. <laughs> Your ad section now because you can't be what you can't buy. Funeral services are so anodyne these days. It's all, they're in a happier place and what a great guy. We can scarcely ha- hope to have our passing marked by the curses of our enemies and the petty rankling grudges of our friends anymore. Bringing you the most memorably appalling funeral rite script book, Dead to Rights, the eulogy with six great funerary speech templates to really drive home what a piece of shit you were, from listing mistresses to unpacking your search history. You don't want people to be sad you're gone, do you? The eulogy. Get yours today, but for later, obviously. If you're looking to pick someone up, but in that negging sort of way because you're doing an incredible online course on how to approach women by a man with the jawline of a serial killer, offer to get her a drink, but then whatever she asks for, bring her half a glass of water. Half a glass of water. If it works, you owe me money. And the Dancy Lagarde Reader is fully funded, but you can still pre-order a copy if you go to unbound.com and search Alice Fraser, or if you go to thebuglepodcast.com and look for the Dancy Lagarde Reader, you can get a copy of the best book about, or the best, the best existing book. <laughs> I thought that was it. You can get a copy of the best book. <laughs> the best book uh, that I am yet to write. No, the best existing book uh, about Dancy Lagarde, the online romance maven and bestseller who I will be uh, partnering with to create the Dancy Lagarde companion for your heart. Now it's time for your top story in the next section, which is our robo taxi news. And this is the news that robo taxi activists, anti robo taxi activists, uh, have realised that they can disable Cruise and Waymo robo taxis by putting a traffic cone on the hood of the vehicle. And they've started doing that and are encouraging other people to do it too, standing in the way of the robot future. Eleanor Morton, you've done some suggestible things with traffic cones before. Can you unpack this story? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, I have. Put them on your head, pretend to be a witch. Come <laughs> that's, on. That's, I mean, they're very heavy, though. You, you don't want to do that unless you've got a robust head. Um, so this is in San Francisco, where I believe basically because it's in like, is it the Tech Valley? Is that what you'd call it? Um it feels like they seem to get all the weird products and new tech as like it's like the experiment ground for that so the locals of san francisco are always having to deal with whatever weird nonsense um tech bros are coming up with and obviously electric cars are not electric cars they might be are they electric they probably are um driverless cars are the big thing wait what does waymo stand for way way more. way more good at driving than human <laughs> piloted <laughs> vehicles <laughs> Um, and people aren't happy with them because, you know, I think uh, I'm, I'm all in favour of progress, but there is something a bit a bit stressful about a car without a driver. Um, it has killed a dog, not on purpose, accidentally. Well, maybe on purpose. Um, it, we don't know the car's um, intentions, but uh, yeah, they are a bit a bit weird and freak people out. And basically, apparently, if you put a cone on the hood. I don't know, I guess it's navigation system freaks out or something. Yeah. But to be fair, if you put a cone on uh, somebody who's driving a car, their navigation system will probably freak out too. Yeah, exactly. That that wouldn't work either. So um, so people have been doing this to kind of stop these cars and sort of do a kind of very gentle protest. I think the, the Waymo people have argued that this is vandalism, but I don't think... It count, I don't think putting a cone on a thing is vandalism. I don't think you could take that to court. Yes, any more than if a, if a graffiti artist just put an easily removable decal on the side of a train. Yeah, or chalk or something. Um, so um, so everyone's all up in arms. And I have to say, San Francisco feels like the worst place to test uh, a driverless car because it is all angles and slopes. And I just feel like that's a disaster waiting to happen. Um, so Not just that, but also like... You've got that divorced dad who dresses up as a nanny and he's always <laughs> running back and forth between two places to change costume. And you don't want that happening when cars are going quickly. Well, right? you know, I don't know. Maybe that would speed up the process if he had a driverless taxi to take him between. 
No, because that's a lot to put into the trolley programming, programming of the internals of this vehicle. These deci- these vehicles have to make split second decisions about whether to run over a man or an old granny, yeah. and if they can't tell which that person is when they're running across the road. They could malfunction as badly as if they presumably had a going they'll on be their programmed heads. to calculate well better to kill the granny because mm. she's had more life yeah. than the young man who is a more productive member of society and has more years to live. Oh, no, no, no. I would say the opposite. I feel like the granny, it depends on how lovable she looks, but mm. she probably has, you know, a loving brood of a family. Whereas if it's like a cold-hearted businessman who loves nobody, get rid of him. Yeah. No, I know, but remember who's writing these algorithms. They're generally <laughs> in favour of the cold-hearted uh, businessman. Valid. Alice, you, I feel like you're very techy. Are you keen on driverless cars they kind of scare me but i guess maybe that's how everyone feels about new technology well look i think that the great thing about um startup culture generally is that it's looking for efficiencies in the business world so you're looking for an efficiency in the business world you're thinking well i can close that uh, gap in the world with by computers i can use that to you know i see this thing i can make it more efficient using technology i can mm. use this make this more efficient using uh, programming and eventually the goal is that you can make something so efficient that you can stop paying the workers um which is of course all of our ambition. Yes. Um, if only there was a way of cutting the consumers out of it as well. <laughs> oh, they try. <laughs> the thing try. is, like, a driverless train doesn't scare me because the DLR is the greatest experience anyone will ever have. And sit Thank at the you. Front and pretending... Oh, sorry, DLR, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> pretending you're the driver on the DLR is um, Docklands Light Rail for the uninitiated is, is one of the greatest joys in life. But... But a train is on tracks and there's really only a couple of things that can go wrong. There's only limited options. A car's just just out there, free in the wild, and I just doesn't fill me with confidence. See, I'm old enough that I've uh, rewound a cassette tape using a pencil. I wonder if children of the future will look back fondly on times when you could uh, disable a, a self-driving car with a traffic cone. Yeah. Look all the days when you put the traffic cone on and immediately shot you in the head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I imagine they'll eventually uh, become transformer cars and if you put the cone on it it transforms into it you know an optimus prime type and then it it will like, take you down any any car is a transformer if you've got a good enough monkey wrench <laughs> <laughs> and a dream, um, and a dream. <laughs> it did uh, it did occur to me that it would make quite a good Robocop sequel if you could disable Robocop by putting a cone on his head <laughs> it would certainly be like uh, yeah a lot of fun Again, I feel like you could disable a regular police officer by putting a cone on their head hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hard enough, I guess. I've also, like, many British, like, cities, for years on Friday and Saturday nights, people have been, like, disabling statues by putting cones on their heads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Never, I've never seen a, I've never seen a statue with a cone on his head moving. So exactly, exactly. And so you've got to say, well done, guys. The thing about America, though, is, is that, Maybe not so. I'm What's the listen. thing about America? You know, guys, guys, listen, listen. The thing about America, they've got they've got endless mile, literally hundreds of miles of straight road. You, do, I don't want a driverless car in Northumberland. Is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. not. It's not a car for twisting, turning roads that the Romans built. Uh, mm-hmm. Although the Romans also like a straight road. But you know what I mean. It's we're not a country. I don't think built for driverless cars and i'm sure australia you can also go for miles in a straight line but um, that's the plot of mad max fuel road <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> yeah. literally is <laughs> there you go imagine how boring that film would be if that was a driverless car <laughs> <laughs> all driverless cars hey wait driverless car chase that would be fun <laughs> just two driverless cars chasing Have each other seen with nobody fast in them. and the furious that <laughs> is <laughs> right <laughs> that is some driverless cars and then some men in a small booth moving their hands like this <laughs> they um my sister's an extra in the ninth one because they filmed it in edinburgh and uh, again i have no idea why you'd want to film a fast and furious in edinburgh it is it is possibly only known for being a terrible city to drive in so oh, but, yeah. i mean yes i was going to say it's known for being uh, slow and calm N- yeah unless you're on the bus in the middle of town and you need to get half a mile away and the traffic means it takes an hour then you're angry very angry but i'm fine And now it's time for your reviews. As you know, each week we ask our guest editors to bring in something to review out of five stars. Eleanor, what have you brought in for us? Um, Seagulls. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I've been living in my new flat. There's a lot of seagulls around. And um, 
you know, I didn't really think about them a lot before now. Is your have... new flat a clamshell? Oh, do you think that's attracting them? Uh, they are really, really noisy. And I don't, I mean, like, I mean, like, it sounds like children, it might be children, children screaming <laughs> nonstop all day, every day. I don't know what's happening, but it's, I've never, I might be anti seagull now um, because of this experience. Like, everything else about where I am now, great, lovely. The seagulls, it just feels like they have a personal vendetta. They are so big. They keep swooping at my windows and I keep thinking like a pterodactyl is outside. Um, so, so far, it's not been, I'd say, like a one star out of five for seagulls. Also, not happy. they're not like, you don't live by the sea. Um, I mean, I guess I sort of do, but yeah, not on the seafront. Then I think if, if it's not the seafront, they're not sticking by their yeah their job title. No, exactly. Seagull. My dad says that they are lesser black-backed seagulls, mm -hmm. and that means that they hopefully won't be here in the winter because they migrate. But then he said that because of climate change, they might stop migrating. So this could be all year round now. So oh. just and this isn't just any dad. Your dad's a bird man. He isn't is he? an ornithologist. Yeah, yeah. No, oh. sorry. Yeah, I don't just <laughs> I don't just go to him. <laughs> just like, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. But yeah. Um, yeah, seagulls bad. A seagull once got its beak underneath my entire fish just as I walked out of the Whoa. fish and chip shop on Brighton Pier. And flicked it out for him and all his other... Like, he didn't... That's he incredible. really planned this thing. I was so sad. I was so sad. I was they so are, sad. They are clever <laughs> and vicious and big. And um, you know what? I'd like a nice kitty wake. It's like a seagull, but it's small and delicate. That's what I'd like to replace them with. It's also what happens after a funeral for a cat. <laughs> He's never off. Uh, John Luke, what have you brought in for us? Um, I'd like to review Portaloos because um, I've been thinking about them. I don't know why. I haven't managed to go to any festivals this year, and I think it's made me nostalgic. Because <laughs> um, their greatest asset, right, is their portability. So you can take them and put them in a field or wherever you need them, or you know, where there's a building site or anything like that. But it's also what makes them the scariest type of loo to use. Most loos, you can like count on the security of going into them sitting on them and thinking, well, great, this loo certainly isn't going anywhere. <laughs> so that's a rare moment of certainty in an uncertain world. But but a portal loo, you can't be sure that you're walking out that door in the same place you went into it. They're too portable. So mm. for their convenience, I would give them a four. For the um, insecurity, I would give them a two. So I give portal loos three stars out of five. Fair, very fair. Uh, I have been in some extremely fancy port which feels uh, morally wrong. Brick port inside <laughs> houses, my gosh. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 when I, when I, had, I had a scholarship at university and there was like a fancy do for it and they had these, they're sort of in uh, demountable kind of shipping container style mm. boxes and you walked in and there was like music playing and real towels for wiping your hands on and you know, gold plated. Real towels instead of toilet paper <laughs> yeah, exactly i mean that's not what you expect in a portaloo uh so yeah it was very upsetting actually it sort of felt discombobulating oh, really? huh. you're like I, I know what to expect from a portaloo and this ain't it you know like like imagining a goose and getting a swan yeah oh. exactly yeah. both of them can break your arm if they try hard enough yeah they, they both can they're pretty vicious um my dad says uh they have fancy <laughs> ones on TV sets, um, but I'm never sure if w the rare occasions I've been on TV sets, I'm not not ever sure if I'm fancy enough to use them. Like, is there a secret portable, port like normal portolo that I should be using? And this is for the fancy actors because I did once join the wrong food queue when I was an extra in something. Um, I joined the food queue for the real actors, and then someone had to come up and be like, "This is the queue for the you're not a real actor. You have to leave." You get a muesli bar and a slap in the face. Yeah. No, to be fair, the food's good, but they they let you know your place when you're getting it. Fair. Here's your delicious food, scum. Now it's time for wind news, and this is the news that uh, the Sea Wing, a technology being developed by a French company, is uh, a kite which they're planning to attach to ships to bring them across the ocean, and not just normal ships like 
like a sailing boat. This is not just the invention of a sailing boat. They are currently testing these massive kites on cargo ships traveling uh, transatlantically between Europe and the US. Uh, John Luke, you've set sail on the high seas and lived the life of a pirate. Can you unpack this story for us? Dread Pirate Roberts, mm-hmm. in fact. Um, um, yes. Yeah. yeah. So they've called it the Sea Wing. Mm-hmm. They're attaching it to shipping containers. Um, they think it will lower emissions by 20%, um, which is just that, like, I think, I always think of 20% as it's sort of borderline ignorable in terms of reduction. Like, if, a, if there's an online sale, which is 10%, you'll go, definitely not. If it's 20%, you'll go, oh, I'll have a look, you know? So it's it's achieving that amount, uh, but in, um, in lowering emissions for boats. But, right, <laughs> what they've done, right, They've invented sails, haven't they? Like, this is just, this is how boats used to get around. They've invented, I mean, is the next thing saying, oh, we can save some emissions by, well, with our new innovation of 30 pairs of oars and a bearded Scandinavian with a drum. Like, (laughs) this is a gritty reboot. This is a gritty reboot of ships. Yeah, so they they put a big kite on, so it looks like a kite surfer, but it's not a fun one. It's a massive shipping container boat going chug, chug, chug. I oh, once saw um, a kite surfer get lifted way off the waves and carried away into the distance. That's fun. Yeah, I think that was. I think it was intentional, but it looked worrying. Um, that does sound fun. Oh, also, the this the sail is powered by an autopilot, so it's it's really easy to stop it working just with a traffic cone. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, if you threw a, a, a traffic cone into a into a kite, it would probably do some damage. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's also, kites have also been shown to lower the emissions from Edwardian children and their fathers by 25%. And, um, and up their sense of narrative conclusion fivefold. <laughs> We've gone so far forward that we're kind of going backwards because uh, sails are quite efficient at taking boats. You know, the problem wasn't so much with the sails, it was with the lack of hygiene and food sources and, um, you know, Krakens. So um, I do wonder if <laughs> the thing about like, so, you know, we seem to be moving forward and I mean, not forward, but, you know, we're advancing in the terms of the, the driverless car. But then we want to go back to sail ships because they do have zero emissions. Um, so maybe that's also the answer for the driverless cars. We could get horse and carts back in or, or a sedan chair. That's fun. No, actually, I think you may, may be on something for you because horse and carts obviously aren't 100 percent fuel efficient because you need to feed the horse yeah but if you put sails on cars on yeah. like on on four-wheel vehicles maybe that's the way forward there you go you see it's all sails from now on wind is is everything yeah And jelly mouse news now. This is the news that scientists have figured out how to make uh, dead, currently dead mice uh, transparent in order to be able to examine their little tiny corpses for disease things after they're dead in the context of cancer research. But uh, basically, they've ma- managed to turn mice in- invisible, sort of. Uh, Eleanor Morton, you like jelly. Can you unpack this story for us? I don't like jelly anymore. Um, so <laughs> what I can, I mean, I'm not, this is going to surprise you, I'm not a scientist, but what I could g- gather from this was that the problem with current cancer research is that it can only detect uh, tumours once they're big enough for our, our current science to see. And what this guy has, or this team has done is they, with this jelly mouse is that they can see very, 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 very small cancer cells and, you know, target them before they get bigger. I'm not quite sure how... So the whole, the, the mouse thing is that you can see inside the mouse because they've made it transparent. You can look this up. It's quite, it is like a little jelly mouse, um, but not like a fun one from a sweet shop, like a, like from some kind of The Thing remake. Um, and um, yeah, you can, you can, so you can see inside and you can see where the cancer cells are. I don't really understand how, someone might be able to explain this to me, how um, this helps humans. Because would we have to go see through to look at our tiny cancer cells? What's the technology that um, what? How does that translate to? But everyone's uh, everyone seemed very excited about it, like it was a real breakthrough. But I'm not quite sure how that um, translates to non mice. Well, I th- I think the idea is it you look at how the cancers grow, like by examining them in the mice, okay. you maybe learn things about how cancer moves. So and... we don't need to go see through. I mean, I kind of am, but well, that's because you're Scottish. But yeah, the yeah. um, that, that's 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 the fear of the sun. <laughs> and I'm half mouse. And half, half mouse, yeah. yeah. 
it's all very I mean to be honest I've always thought mice were pretty transparent I've not had one mice one mouse show any interest in me without knowing that's because of the cheese you just want the cheese <laughs> this guy is what's he called he's called Professor Ali Ertuk uh, from the, the University of Munich and I bet like all the other scientists are absolutely sick of his stuff like oh what are you up to Ali oh I'm, I'm fighting cancer oh yeah how are you fighting cancer oh I've made a mouse invisible oh right good Ali how are you fighting cancer today oh I've taught a squirrel to tap dance uh -huh. what about I put gills on a capybara yeah okay Ali do you want to I've made a tortoise that constantly spins okay do you think it's the same guy who put the ear on the mouse Almost certainly. <laughs> Almost certainly. If not, then there's a problem. What one? If there's just one rogue scientist, then it's like, that's one bad apple. If it's all scientists doing these things to mice, we really need to look at what kind of person. I think if we've learned anything from the gargle, it's that there are scientists doing some very strange things. Specifically to mice. But it is, a, it is, to be fair, a question, Alice, as to whether we've learned anything from the gargle. <laughs> <laughs> If you have, if you have, please write into us and we'll give you your money back immediately. That is the opposite of our intention. I've learned that I don't want to see a, a see-through mouse. That wasn't as whimsical well, as I was actually, first Eleanor, picturing. Yeah. The upside good news is for you, you, you don't need to see a see-through <laughs> mouse. Uh, set we just up piled up. over each other to get to that one, didn't we? <laughs> um, no, it's. Uh, I mean. Um, my family, we're a gerbil people. No, love. my family was a sitcom on BBC One. <laughs> Alice, I talked about this. I can't remember the gargle. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, we we like gerbils in uh, in our household. We have had numerous gerbils, and um, uh, if they went see through, I think the only thing you'd learn is that they shouldn't eat grapes. <laughs> oh, What's the difference between a gerbil and a hamster? People always ask this. I feel like it's pretty obvious. They're, they're totally different, but people don't oh, seem right. to know much about gerbils. They're, they're, gerbils are desert mice, so, sorry, uh, sidebar. Mm -hmm. So, um, so they're desert mice, so they are basically like a mouse, but slightly differently designed in that they've got bigger feet for scurrying around the desert, and mm. um, they've got a long tail, and also they're just more fun. Hamsters are really shit, if I'm totally honest. Hamsters are rubbish. They're mm. nocturnal, they're aggressive, they don't like hanging out with anyone else. Mm. They, they're rubbish. Sorry, I just feel quite strongly about it. I mean, I can tell. That brings us to the end of the show, unfortunately. I'm flipping through the ads at the back. Uh, Eleanor, have you got anything that you'd like to plug? Um, only my current and forever online presence, which you can find just by Googling me. And I'm not now on threads like all of us, so that's an extra, th I know, extra thing to add. And then I will be doing a one-off character show on the 14th in... Uh, at the Edinburgh stand, 14th of August, during the Fringe, and a three-day, uh, 14th, 15th, 16th, work in progress show about ghosts at Monkey Barrel, uh, at the Fringe as well, at various times. So please just Google me and you'll find all the information. Excellent. John Luke, have you got anything to plug? Um, this Sunday, the 16th of July, I'm recording my show, A World Just Like Our Own, but dot, 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 um, at the Moth Club at 9pm and that's the last time I'm going to do the show for a while so if you're in or around London please come to that Tip tickets are very cheap at £5.50 and you can find them by googling Dice and John Luke Roberts um, and Dice? Dice it's on the website Dice that's how the ticket website okay. and that it seems if you just google John Luke Roberts filming July 16th it won't bring it up which is something I think probably wrong with how Dice are setting their website up for uh. Uh, internet um, get getting at it ability. The um, search engine is unoptimized. Yes, thank you. And uh, you can also see me all through the summer in a show called Hairy, which is a children's theatre show in South Wimbledon made with Spy Monkey, who are a brilliant comedy troupe and the only comedy, well, in fact, probably the only people who could get me to do children's theatre in South Wimbledon. But it's. Um, <laughs> It it's looks really fun. good, I think. It looks like the images. It looks amazing. I know that much, and I think it's also pretty, pretty, pretty damn good as well. If you have children between the ages of five and twelve, or even if you don't, I think it's quite fun. 
and we, the Gargle, will be at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. You can find tickets and details for that at thebuglepodcast.com. Also, I'm Alice Fraser. Find me online at patreon.com slash Alice Fraser. It's a one-stop shop for all of my stand-up specials, podcasts, and blogs, as well as my weekly writers' meetings if you want to come and write uh, with other people. It's a really fun thing to do. We have a, a little writing session, a little workshop. I enjoy it very much. This is a Bugle Podcast and Alice Fraser production. Your editor is Ped Hunter. Your executive producer is Chris Skinner. I'll talk to you again next week. You can listen to other programs from The Bugle, including The Bugle, Catharsis, Tiny Revolutions, Top Stories and The Gargle, wherever you find your podcasts. 